Um, hello, everyone. Um, also, hello to the live stream. Just a quick note. I put the link to this slide deck uh, in the meetup.com page, so you can also find it later as a comment, and you can follow along at the um, live on, on your screen at home. Um, OK, works. Yay. So hi, um, my name is Ben. I'm one of the core, developer, uh, core developers of Substrate, working for Parity. Um, but blockchain is not my background. I actually come from the social web 1.0 and later 2.0. I built communities uh, in the classic web space. Um, Discourse might be a software that some of you are familiar with. I contributed to that in the early days. Uh, before the post Snowden happened, and I moved more into the um, privacy first, offline ready, peer to peer community, community networking sphere of things. I'm saying this because I don't come from the blockchain world, I don't come from the crypto coin world, um, and I joined this project because I am mostly interested in dApps, in decentralized apps and its infrastructure. Remember dApps, like the future, right? Um, or maybe the past's future, because it's been a while that we have, this has been around. Like the, the, I don't know if you remember, but um, the David Johnston kind of definition of a DAB um, that happened in late of 2013, um, and the also the blog post that uh, Vitalik posted on the Ethereum blog was actually May of 2014. It's been around for a while. It's been five years now, um, and even back then they already acknowledged that um, within that definition other things apply that are even older, like BitTorrent or Bitcoin, for example. So um, this idea has been around for a while, and I'm wondering, like, but where are all the dApps at? Like, there should be more, right? I mean, don't get me wrong, I understand there's, like, if you go to the state of dApp.com, there's 2,432 dApps uh, around, and um, especially, like, considering that this is four, five years, yeah, a lot has happened, obviously. Uh, we have seen plenty of uh, weather, uh, contracts uh, de being deployed to, to Ethereum. We've seen over specifically the last two, three years, uh, what feels like a gazillion ICOs, though not all of them actually needing blockchain. Um, and we have seen uh, a lot of things happen. We have seen new platforms emerge, like Steam and EOS, and um, frameworks built on top of these to make it easier to build applications, like Status IM or, or Aragon. Um, and we've also seen really new applications in the DApp sector like Zcash and, and privacy-focused systems like Grin, which launched earlier this month. Um, we've seen also from the not so blockchain-y part of this ecosystem, things like the DAD Beaker browser or Opera moving into this, into this field of allowing browsing uh, in the decentralized web. And um, another thing, like late last year, the first mobile client for Scuttlebutt uh, for secure, secure Scuttlebutt launched, which is called Maniverse. But if you look at that, like I've, I've pointed out like some specific projects here, but the majority of what happened is in the top part, and it feels like there's a lot more noise than actual signal um, if we look at the entire things and what happens. And I wonder why, why is that? Um, and if you come to think of it, it's because building a DAP is still pretty hard. <laughs> Like, it has been hard, and it still is very hard. And um, there's new things we learned about building dApps that, that have come since, and I want to look at that by looking at a, a few specific projects. I'm not talking about all the problems, but if there's a few things that I feel like we're not talking about enough. Um, one very famous project I think you all have heard about um, is the CryptoKitties. You have heard about it at least when it made international headlines that it effectively broke Ethereum. Um, and the reason that this happened, a quick reminder, uh, it's, a, it's a more or less simplistic game on top of an Ethereum contract um, that allows you to trade um, cats, a, a fungible asset, uh, tulips, if you will. Um, but what it showed was that there's a fundamental problem in, in the way that we're currently approaching this, and that is that I'm running a dApp. Like the, the people were not mad 
that um, crypto that the crypto kitties transactions didn't go through there were a lot going on so that was fine but other people having other dApps were annoyed that their transactions didn't go through and that's a side effect that we noticed for the first time really is that you running your dApp on such a platform um, on a general purpose platform means it might be affected for things completely unrelated um, for example the popularity of another dApp the prices change, and that has nothing to do with what you provide or your, or your customers want to see. And that is um, quite the opposite of the network effect that we actually wanted. Um, like the, the, the idea of the peer-to-peer -peer network effect is that when you add more nodes to the network and things become popular, spreading of them becomes faster, more performant, easier. But we see the opposite here. When things become popular, it becomes a bottleneck. Um, and it appears that we've moved this this peer-to-peer -peer performance layer that exists still on this lower layer. In the networking layer, these blocks are still distributed really fast. It's really, that all works. But we've moved the entire scalability issue of popularity of apps just one level higher. And they can't really deal with that. Like, we don't have a really good idea of how to deal with that. We have some mitigation tactics and we're working on them. But there's a, this is a fundamental architectural problem we're facing. Um, and that CryptoKitties really just pointed out. Um, until today, like, what is CryptoKitties supposed to do to fix this? There isn't really much they can do, and this is, this is an issue. Um, I want to look at the, another project that you might have heard of, uh, Pipeth, which is interesting because it is a past CryptoKitties project that specifically um, took learnings from what CryptoKitties did or what happened with CryptoKitties. Um, in case you don't know it, it's a Twitter-like social network built around an Ethereum contract that looks like this, aside from the Twitter stream that I phased out here. And a few things that they learned is um, they don't really use Ethereum and Ethereum storage for everything. They primarily use it for the, for the accounting system that it provides. It's an it's a easy, like a Facebook login kind of replacement. Um, and one thing they, they added on top to not clock the transaction pipeline is that they batch updates. So you can always just send in your own transaction and um, do that on your own, or you can go through their service and they batch a bunch of these updates together. And so through that, they try to mitigate the problem of um, clogging the pipeline. That has an interesting side effect that allows for free peeping. Um, so in, in the classic system, in a gas metered chain, you cannot do anything for free, right? It's like a, a chain could offer that, but that would be very easily be spam attacked. Um, so chains don't usually offer, offer that, but I don't want to pay for every tweet I do. Like most people won't do that. They will simply not tweet. Um, and they attack this issue by allowing like, at the beginning you have to pay for it, but once you have reputation with the system, they do the paying for you, you go through their system, and this allows you free peeping. Uh, which is what they called them. And they don't actually store most of the content um, on Ethereum itself, but they store it on IPFS. So they mostly have references to IPFS storage on the system. But if we look a little closer at the project, we also notice that this particular part that I was talking about, this entire batch updates and allowing free peeping and that kind of stuff, that is a closed source front end to that contract. You can still use that contract um, and you can just go through the normal transaction system, but if you want any of these new features that they've built, you have to go through a centralized system that they provide on people.com. Um, and that effectively means there is a centralized control again. Um, don't get me wrong, I think this is not wrong here. I'm just wanting to point out a, an architectural issue here, because I, I do like their project. I think what they're doing is great, but one fundamental thing they're trying to address is not to make Twitter decentralized. That's not Twitter's problem, but moderation. Twitter's problem is moderation, and they have interesting approaches to doing that and allowing better the moderation and, and to build a different type of community, but they can't express that in these kind of free-for-all, open-for-all contracts simply not possible in the current system that they have. And so what they did is they built another system in front of it that allows them to exert that, exert that control. But unfortunately, that is centralized again. I'm going to look at two more projects that I mentioned before. The one is Zcash and the other one is Grin. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Uh, so if you don't know about Zcash, Zcash launched in, uh, launched, uh, in October 2016. Um, it's a ZK-SNARKs-based zero-knowledge transaction system, basically a private transaction system. Um, they built their system by forking the Bitcoin client and replaced the stuff that they needed to replace in order to build their system. Um, but it's its own full blockchain in any sense of the meaning. Um, and I'm not sure, but I don't think it has a contract or similar system on top at the moment. The other one is Grin, which just launched earlier this month in, uh, in mainnet, um, which is a Mimblewimble private transaction system. So these are two privacy-oriented systems allowing you to do transactions um, in, in a private manner. Um, they have been obviously not able to, I assume that they figured out that they cannot just fork another code base and change some parts in order to be able to launch their project. So they created their own Rust client from scratch. And they started doing this in October 2016. And as mentioned before, they launched um, in January this year. Uh, just a, a quick reminder how long October 2016 is ago. That is before that orange man was elected president. That is really long in, in our terms of, of computer science and what we do here. Um, it takes a long time to build these things. And that is the, the fundamental problems I, I'm seeing at the moment. Is you have, if you want to build a DAP, you have effectively two ways to do that. Um, either you, you go through the smart contract way, um, which means you need to be okay with the contract model and its sandboxing model. You need to be somewhat okay with the gas, uh, gas metered market and that it's outside of your control, which is something that we hear a lot is like, I cannot, I cannot tell my customers that the transaction you did yesterday is going to be twice as expensive today. I cannot explain that to my customers. Um, there's a lot of cases where this is fine, but there's also a bunch of cases where it's not. Um, and you need to be all right with what the current privacy implications are about this state transaction system. You can mitigate some of the systems, and this is why I picked the problems, uh, the, the cases I did, by adding other services around that, like PPATH does. But what we are seeing when these um, systems are added is if you, if you attempt to fix a problem and there is no easy way to do that decentralized, you will navigate towards the centralized solution to it because you intentionally just want to solve that problem. Um, but it's a default behavior. You, you end up with a, uh, a centralized system. Or you can come with what I call BIYOE, bring your own everything. Um, sometimes you're lucky. You can fork off a different code base. You can use the Bitcoin client because it's what you want to change is fairly small enough that, that it can work in there, or you go to our Ethereum client, um, which is what I, we have been doing uh, at Parity for enterprise projects. Um, we've mangled around with it a lot, and now certain things are easier to replace, but it hasn't been built for that. Neither of those projects have been built to be easily replaceable modules. Um, and even if you have that, it's still really hard to get this right. Um, it's still a lot of work. It, it's very costly. In doubt, you have to effectively build everything yourself. And the blockchain and everything that is required is a lot of work. There's a lot of modules going into that, a lot of things that you need to do. Um, <clears throat> and that is very often unnecessary work. If you want to try out a new consensus algorithm, why the hell do you need to build a database? Why do you need to come up with, with your own networking scheme? This is a lot of work that you might not be the expert for in the first place. Um, but moreover, that has been like sort of figured out for a big part, which all comes down to what I said before. Building a DAP is still pretty hard. Um, but because of these two factors that we are seeing, one part is that because we are not offering good decentralized solutions for a lot of actual problems that DAPs have, they gravitate towards building centralized fixes around them. And then they go offline, and we don't have the source code, and we're stuck with what we had before. Um, and on the other part, if you really want to change other things that are outside of the, the, the scope that even a centralized server around a, a contract can offer, um, you basically have to build a lot of stuff. And some people argue, yeah, well, you need to be able to do that. Otherwise, it doesn't make sense. But it's an, an unnecessary barrier for entry. If you really want to, you have this most amazing new hashing algorithm and you want to try it on big scale 
Why do you need to build all of that? That's, that's not correct. And that means we stifle innovation at this moment um, because we expect people to build a lot more that they don't necessarily need to build. Um, and of course, this is where our company and their product comes in. Uh, yay! Uh, who would have guessed um, <laughs> that, that we are um, trying to build something that can help us with these problems? Um, so, a quick reminder for the scope of this talk, Substrate is a Polkadot-compatible general-purpose blockchain uh, development kit in Rust, meaning that you can build your own blockchain, we say fairly easily, um, out of the parts that we provide. In particular, it allows you to focus on the actual chain logic um, when building your chain. What does that mean? When, when you think of a, a node in the network, a, a peer, um, in our default system, it's called Substrate Node. Um, there's, as mentioned before, a lot of things that it needs to provide. It needs to be able to do networking, secure networking, best case. Uh, it needs to synchronize blocks across the entire network. It needs to have a consensus system, database, yada, yada, yada. There's, I think, 18 different modules that we currently um, have that are going into this. Um, but if all you want to do is build a CryptoKitties, you mostly don't care. This is not where your business logic lies. This is um, coming from the web world. Like, I, I build a lot of web servers. I don't parse HTTP headers. That's not what I do. This is not what my clients pay me for. This is what I have libraries and modules for. And this is exactly where, where Polkadot, uh, where Substrate, attempts to offer a solution to say, this thing, that actual state transition function, we call that the chain runtime. That is something you can completely do as you please. Um, while um, these all come with decent defaults. You can still configure them. You can change the configuration. You can change, um, hopefully, through more consensus algorithms. Currently, we don't provide that many, but we want to provide more. Um, but you don't have to build your own consensus engine and, and all of that kind of stuff. And that this is generally achievable is something that uh, Gav showed at the Web3 Summit already when he very famously um, got a factory sealed MacBook Pro, gave it to a volunteer from the audience, let that person set up the entire MacBook, including a substrate development environment, while Gav was giving his talk, and then sat down at the computer and built a new chain and upgraded the chain logic live on stage. Um, I forgot, I should show this. Um, so that this is a general something that is possible and, and plausible to do um, has been proven. But as mentioned before, yesterday we took another step in this. And this is the, um, the first iteration of the sub Substrate Collectible Workshop, which happened right across there. Um, a, a workshop where we a hands-on self-learning material that should allow everyone to get up to speed to build such a system. And Sean is going to show you a little bit about that. You need yeah, connected. Hi. <laughs> Can I steal, can I steal a spot that you've taken? Thanks. Give me one second to connect. Hi, my name is Sean Tabrizi. Uh, I'm a recently uh, pretty new dev at Parity, and uh, I've spent some time uh, recently trying to hack on Substrate, basically. Um, I think Ben mentioned, uh, you know, and I just want to reiterate, you know, that uh, basically building dApps, if you wanted to build uh, a cool idea, you maybe the easiest thing you could do is you know, rely on the existing infrastructure, something like Ethereum, build a smart contract on top of it, because building networking layer, building database, all that kind of stuff, it's really hard. But in the current day, with Substrate, there might be other options. There might be ways that you can build your app in a scalable, you know, uh, way, and you have a lot more control over what is happening with your chain. And that's kind of what the Substrate node template does. So uh, as Ben mentioned, uh, you can build a Substrate node. This template that we provide is a way, kind of a framework, the minimal things you need to get your node running. And really, all I've been doing is kind of been hacking on this and seeing what we can do and pushing the limits and trying to get feedback for how this works. And one of the things I wanted to do, I think uh, Ben alluded to, was build a kiddies app. So uh, I basically thought to myself, OK, what would happen if I could build sub, um, crypto kitties on Substrate uh, what would it look like, how would it work, and would it work at all? And that's basically kind of what I did. 
Um, I went through, I uh, spent a lot of time learning uh, how to build this, uh, basically all the parts of the runtime, all the logic, emulating the simplest parts of CryptoKitties, I think that makes it more, the most like recognizable. And from that, we built a workshop kind of uh, teaching all the knowledge, all the steps from beginning to end of how you could actually do this yourself. And that's what we did yesterday for the first time, showing off this workshop and actually making it run through. So uh, I wanna actually show a quick demo real quick. So at the end to end, so give you a second idea. So this is kind of the repo it works. There's kind of two halves. There is a, uh, the node template, which I've modified and added my own logic to. And then also uh, the UI element. And together, this creates what we consider the DAP. So if we go actually back to here, we can see this is, uh, ooh, I don't like this formatting. Okay, well, <laughs> CSS aside, uh, you can see here we have an app running on a blockchain. Um, we have accounts with balances. And if I wanted to go and create a new kitty, I could specify a user, like Alice, and we can create a kitty. Once the transaction gets finalized, a new random kitty should be generated and Alice should be the owner. This is all happening on a, on a blockchain running on my computer. And then we can do things that are very famous for crypto kitties, things like breeding. So let's take two kitties and I'll copy this ID, and I'll be using another tool, like the, something called the Polkadot UI, which is a more general kind of tool for debugging and being able to interact with your chain. Um, and I'll do run another function. You can see I have multiple functions here I've built into my chain. Uh, this one do breed kitty. So we'll take the ID of one cat, and we'll take the ID of another cat, and we should see that we produce an offspring which has traits of both. And again, this is a very, I think, popular thing that is, ha happens on the CryptoKitties chain. Yeah, as you can see, maybe it has the bow here, uh, might have a different smile. This one looks like an exact clone of this one. And we can try to copy, again, right now we only have five traits, so it's, you know, the two in, uh, there's a chance that, oops, there's a chance that uh, it may just produce a similar, I wanna see if I can get one that mixes them up. Yeah, you can see that the mouth is pulled from a you know, different mouth, but has the same, you know, color as this one, has a different, Thing. Yeah, so again, you can see we have these kitties, you can build it. And again, uh, I wanted to walk someone through how could they can get to this step, how from no knowledge about substrate development, how you can get here. And really what we've done is built what I think is a pretty good collectibles workshop. Um, it should walk you from the very beginning on how to get your node set up, how to create a module, what a module is, how to store values, and eventually how to actually create events, track kitties, own multiple kitties, you know, do all the management and storage and do things safely and the best practices that we have right now. Um, and really, um, you know, up until now, if you wanted to build on Substrate, I'm sure some people are in this room who I have, have, like, can tell you how difficult it has been. But uh, all the knowledge that I have gained from within the company and from building on this myself, I'm trying to put here, and this uh, workshop will continue to grow. And I think really what we're trying to say is that as of yesterday, we test this out. I think a lot of people give us great feedback, and but most importantly, people were actually successful in getting through this process and building their own chain. So we really encourage you to do the same to give us feedback, to tell us what we need to know or what we can improve on to iterate, and really we want to prepare a whole new set of developers to be able to easily build on Substrate and really you know, push the limits of what we can do and what your ideas can you know, form on this awesome platform. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. One more thing before I give up the mic. Uh, again, this is all, all open source, so you can actually go and you can find uh, the workshop on GitHub right here. And so not only do I expect you to check it out, try it out, but also, you know, again, open issues, open pull requests. We love to hear feedback, and we really love to iterate and make this kind of a really like a first class um, instructional guide to get from zero to 60. Thanks. Um, there's the link. I'm going to put it into the meetup uh, information as well. Um, don't worry, you can find it later. Um, we encourage you, it's, it, you saw the material, to also go through by yourself. Um, it should be doable. We had coaches here. Uh, that is always helpful. Um, it's also more fun if you do it in groups, so that's a recommendation. Um, we will actually run a second iteration of that. This goes primarily also to the feed out there, uh, at FOSDEM in Brussels on the weekend, on Saturday. I'm going to also put the link to sign up for that into the description. Um, coming back to the topic then, so is that the future? Like, um, all the problems I mentioned, it's just everybody building their own chain now? Is that, is that what we do? Um, well, maybe. 
I don't know. Um, shout out to, to Aragon, um, who've announced today. Um, this is why you do the slides on the same day that you do the presentation. You don't know what comes out on Twitter. Um, who've announced that they're actually researching whether they want to build a own blockchain for their, for specifically for DAOs um, connected to Polkadot. I'm not aware if they do use Substrate for that, but I recommend that they try. Um, however, of course, there's things to consider. I'm, I'm not telling you that everything is uh, rainbows and, and unicorns here. Um, at this very moment, with this step forward, it's getting better, but it's still harder to build a runtime than uh, a WASM contract. That is prim uh, an Ethereum contract. That is primarily because it's a new language, it's Rust, that you would have to do if you use our tooling. Um, to do that, you can run any anything that compiles to WASM, but I recommend Rust, first off, because it's good for this. It's generally a good language to do that. Um, and then secondly, we provide a lot of modules. I'm going to come back to that later. Um, but in general, we have less experience in doing this. We have less experience in, in just building runtimes um, than we have with contracts. We also have fewer tools around this. Um, but you notice all three of them are things we can improve on and we will improve on over the year. Um, we have a, a strong focus to make all of these less painful. Um, and I think we're getting there. Um, the other thing is that interactivity between dApps becomes a different thing. If every dApp is their own chain, or at least a lot of dApps are not on the same chain anymore, you cannot just call a function of another contract. Um, because it's not living on your chain, it's living on a different chain. Um, the same goes for if you build an entire chain, it's also an entire chain. You need a network, you need, you need enough nodes to actually connect for this to be secure in the first place. Uh, for both of that, Polkadot aims to solve this, right? I mean, Polkadot, and specifically, its relay chain mechanism allows you to have message passing between chains. And this is a, a key important part that differentiates a Substrate from many other frameworks that are out there. Um, but that will still be different. Like, you're passing a message down, and you might get a message back. It's still not a function call. It's still going to be asynchronous. Um, and you have to rely on a different different chain, and you have to rely on a different format um, that the chain might provide. Um, but if you become a parachain, specifically in the Polkadot network, or actually in any consensus, uh, on any consortium that runs a Polkadot-style network, um, you can directly piggyback on the system of that network. You could deploy the system, um, and it becomes a parachain, and then the entire security of the network um, and spread of the network would help you alleviate that second problem. Um, one other thing that is fundamentally different is the way that code reuse works. Uh, it is a lot closer to what you would consider a classic software code reuse model, where, um, or classic in the sense that most software projects today use something like this, where you have packages of libraries. Um, in our system, we we provide a bunch of helpers to build a runtime, which is called the uh, Substrate Runtime Module Library. And these are modules. This is not even accurate anymore. We've, we've changed some of the structures here. Um, but each one of them is going to be packaged and can be downloaded through Crates.io, which is the package management system for Rust. And that also means that other people can provide other modules that you can pull from Crates.io, and Cargo is really good at allowing you to do that. Um, to offer a wider variety of things that can be done on a chain. Um, and anybody can just um, plug them in and use them. Going from, from the other parts, um, it's because Substrate is meant to do exactly what I'm, what I'm telling you to do. It has solved this, this general problem that you have in frameworks, in libraries, that attempt to allow developers to do something. Um, that you want them to have minimum effort while have maximum freedom, which is generally at odds in one another, and you have to choose one or the other in a, I, I'd say, unique way by offering varying degrees of effort versus freedom. Um, the runtime module library that we were talking about right now and that also the workshop is focusing on is one particular part that um, comes with a lot of things set up for you, like you cannot change the hashing algorithm at that moment, for example, because parts of the module library depend on that. Um, but if you do not use these specific modules, then you might be able to change it. Then you have to move up 
and use Substrate Core. You can change um, most parts of Substrate Core if you really want to. You can use a different consensus algorithm. It's meant to be pluggable already for the fact that we need a different system in, uh, in Polkadot, which is built using Substrate, um, than we have for Substrate Node, because it's a lot more complex in Polkadot. Um, the same goes for the database system. We want to see new and interesting ideas of how to deal with this really interesting, different type of data that we, that we produce in here that is largely inefficient in a key value store, to be honest. Um, and this is why we made the entire system, the, the higher you go, the, the more freedom you get. You can also just only connect to Polkadot uh, itself uh, and connect on that. Um, but at the same time, it comes with a lot of things that are built in. You can uh, basically switch on if you want them. I'm not going to go through the entire list. Uh, as mentioned, this is something that um, I'm going to put the slides up. Um, but this is not just the general pitch I want to give today. What, what I want to talk to you about today is what else? What else should we do with this in, in 2019? Um, in particular, we are most of us infrastructure people. We built these kind of systems and we built them uh, happily, but we're not building dApps in general. Um, so we would like to to see you use it and tell us what what else should we should, what else should we build in? Should we have other things that we don't know yet about, or like a, a bunch of ideas come to mind when we just talk about them? It's like, should we have other consensus engines? Should we have a, a proof of work consensus engine? Should we have maybe a Mimble Wimble? That sounds uh, fascinating. Or Parsec, which is what Matesev uses now. Um, should we plug in other protocols, like one I mentioned earlier today with uh, IPFS being used definitely by a lot of uh, dApps? Well, how, how about we provide that so that you can directly use that? What about that, Filecoin, when it's going to be there? Um, or how about additional crypto features that, that help you build things that currently aren't possible because uh, state transitions don't allow you to do that, like uh, secret stores or self-encrypt features? Um, and in particular, also privacy features like the the, the Grin style um, private transactions. We think that could be possible to provide that as a module. You don't need to have this entire thing that they they needed to build. Um, the necessity was there. Um, how about a zk snarks module that you could use um, to have zk snarks kind of behavior in your system? Um, you can see we can think of many, but we don't want to build them in a in a in a vacuum. And that's, there's, there's no point in doing that. So I'm asking you, and this is also why we're showing this, uh, to grab chat Substrate, to try this workshop, to, to learn how to use a runtime, um, and then try your own thing. Try your dab. Um, see how far you can get it. And, and join us on uh, the new subreddit that we created, or um, through Matrix on Substrate Technical, and tell us about it. What worked, what didn't work, what what didn't work, um, what problems do you have, what other features are you missing. Um, we want your feedback so we can build more and awesome things this year uh, on Substrate. And that's it. Thank you very much.